Chapter 9 When I woke up, Nathan's bed was empty. I got down to the kitchen in double time to see what kind of shape he was in. I felt a little disconcerted to find him sitting at the table with Mrs. Whitley and Artis, having coffee. He still looked pale and hollow-eyed, but his expression wasn't tired. He glanced at me placidly and went on talking. So we put together a couple of songs for him. "'Just like that,' his mom said admiringly. "'Hey, Tim,' Nathan said. "'Artis got up to get me a cup of coffee, "'waving me away when I tried to get it myself. "'Hey, yourself,' I said, nodding good morning at Mrs. Whitley. "'Well, sounds like a pretty productive night,' Mrs. Whitley said. "'She was generally more sympathetic to Nate's music than his father, "'at least when Brother Whitley wasn't around. "'Sure was,' I said. I started fixing myself a bowl of cereal with bananas, and on an impulse got a bowl out for Nathan, too. When I set it in front of him, filled, he looked at me as if I were crazy. "'I'm your manager, remember?' I told him. "'Eat!' "'I don't want any.' "'You haven't eaten since five o'clock yesterday. Eat it.' He got that belligerent set to his mouth, but Mrs. Whitley, who evidently thought it was sweet that I was so concerned about him, said, Now, Nathan, he's right. Listen to your friend. You need to eat. Nathan glared at me, but I stared him down. He must have seen something deadly serious in my expression, because he blinked and reluctantly picked up his spoon. Yeah, I thought, if Egan's going to be sucking the life out of you, you sure better put some back in. I kept an eye on him while he ate like someone taking medicine. But he finished the bowl except for a little milk, and it seemed to me his face had more color. That was really important to me, that small victory, one thing at least that I'd been able to do. Then I felt defeated all over again after we got over to the church to finish up before Sunday, because Nathan didn't remember a thing about being so washed out the night before, or said he didn't. I just got a little tired, he insisted. Nathan, I practically had to carry you into the house. We were in the sanctuary, straightening the hymnals and the pew racks, and I was doing that and keeping an eye out for snakes and making my point at the same time. Don't you understand what's happening? Nothing's happening. Well, I disagree. I think Egan's taking your energy out of you some way. I was trying to avoid words like sucking and feeding so I wouldn't sound overdramatic. Think a minute. He hasn't seen you all week, and he shows up looking tired and washed out, right? By the time we left last night, you're the one who's washed out, and he's all bright and healthy and looking ten years younger. You're insane, Nathan told me. You're absolutely nuts. Nate, what happened last night isn't normal. If what I'm saying isn't true, then you better get to a doctor and ask him why you get so tired every time you're around Egan. In a burst of temper, Nathan threw the hymnal he was holding into the pew beside him. Damn it, Tim. I know you don't like Egan, okay? But it's your problem. Don't make it mine. My own temper rose, but before I could speak, he went on. Nobody has ever felt the way about my music that he does. Nobody has ever taken it seriously, acted like it was something something good, not my parents or anybody at school or even you or Paige. He paced out into the center aisle. And now you're trying to mess that up, spoil it all. Well, you just leave it alone, you hear? If you don't want to work with Egan, fine, but I'm going to. You got that? All of a sudden, I was angry and tired and tired of being angry. All the worrying I'd done over Nathan, and this was the thanks I got. This hasn't been any picnic for me, either. The thought went through my head that, actually, I'd had three picnics in the month I'd been here, but I brushed it aside. Working over here, and working our butts off for Egan, and watching you wear yourself out, and almost getting killed by a rattlesnake, and spades popping up everywhere. Nathan was still mad, breathing hard, but he watched me a little uncertainly. I was never sure if I meant this or not, but I said, I'm going back to California. I'm calling today and getting my ticket changed and then leaving as soon as I can. I don't need this shit. Any other guy would have told me, okay, fine, fuck you, out of sheer pride, and that would have been that. 
But Nathan, the most honest person in the world, sank into a pew, leaned his elbows on the back of the pew in front, and put his head in his hands. I don't want you to do that, he said. I'm telling you, Nathan, I don't need this. Even to myself, though, I didn't sound nearly as angry. I don't want it to be like this. I gave up and sat down in another pew. Me neither. It hasn't been much fun for you, I reckon. Oh, hell, Nathan, that's not the point. No, I didn't ask you to come here just to work you to death. It's not the work. It's Egan. Something's not right about him, and I don't like it. Nathan sat back in the pew and sighed. Okay, I know weird stuff has been happening, and I agree that it's something trying to stop us. Devil, enemy, negative force, whatever you want to call it. Devil is about as good as anything, I said, and I swear that at that moment we heard a long, low rumble of thunder from outside. Nathan glanced uneasily toward the stained glass windows, which had darkened. I was suddenly conscious of the overhead sanctuary lights being on, as if it had started to turn into night time. But I don't believe it's the river man, Nathan said. I refuse to believe that about one of my friends. That's what it wants, to make us all suspicious of each other. I think you're wrong, I said helplessly. And I think you are. We'll have to agree to disagree about that, I reckon. I reckon. And if you want to stop working with him, or Nathan swallowed, you want to go back to California, well, that's up to you. Well, of course, that was what Egan wanted, me out of the picture, one less person in his way. I swore to myself that I would stay even more in his way from now on. No chance, I told Nate. I'm with you. Nathan's relieved grin shone across the aisle at me, just as rain hit the windows. His smile dimmed. We better get back to work. Wait just a minute. You haven't heard my conditions. Nathan sat back down. Conditions? For staying here. I was about to do some shameless manipulating, using Nathan's ever-ready guilt as a handle. First of all, I'm not going to watch you burn yourself out anymore. You start eating, and you quit staying up half the night working. Deal? He thought about it, but he said, Deal. And I want you to pace yourself around Egan. Pace myself? Quit being so anxious to please him, man. You get all used up in 15 minutes, and then run on empty the rest of the time. I was losing him. He had no idea what I meant. Don't feed him so much so fast was what I meant. Just slow down, I pleaded. I can't slow down, he said stubbornly. I don't know how. Well, God doesn't want you all used up at once, does he? Any more than a coach would want you using up all your steam in the first few minutes of a game. Nathan's face changed as this hit home, and he raised an eyebrow and shrugged. Okay, he said. I'll be careful. All right, then. I might have known the God card would work. If Nathan had thought God wanted him to jump off the church roof, he'd have done it. What really disgusted me was that he believed in a God who might actually want him to do something like that. It was still raining when we were done with our janitorial duties. Nathan had stayed in a pretty cheerful mood while we worked. But as we locked the church door and stood on the covered stoop, hoping the rain would let up before we ran for it, he looked bleak. Welcome to the Tennessee monsoon season, he said. It does kind of pour, doesn't it? I hate rain. He shuddered a little. Well, you want stuff to grow, don't you? Flowers, trees? He didn't laugh. It's like being closed in with sheets or something around you, just wrapped up in wet, clammy old rain. There's your next song. The rain slackened, and we dashed for the parsonage. I was glad to get there, enjoying the lighted house and the afternoon pot of coffee artists made. But Nathan only wandered from room to room, staring out the windows and waiting for the sun to come out again. It did, of course, and Paige came to supper before the gig and brought her own unique aura of sunshine. She acted arch with Nathan at first, still mad because he'd gone off and left her on the night of the fourth. But they went off together in the living room and returned a few minutes later, looking as if they definitely made up. 
My jealous heart, of course, knew they'd been kissing, and she looked so beautiful in her purple lacy blouse, and I was miserable for a little while. But we had a good supper, Brother Whitley evidently having forgiven Nathan for running out on the Fourth of July church service. They loved him so much that they couldn't stay angry at him long, and I remember him at his kindest that night, not saying much, but listening and smiling, a sort of giving presence. He ate, too, under my watchful eye, and after supper he even played the piano for his parents. Artis and Paige and I cleaned the kitchen, me happy to be in Paige's presence, and Artis flatteringly happy to be in mine. I remember that evening as one of the happiest of the summer, simply because it wasn't trying to be, it just was. I loved being in the center of that family, and I would never have carried out my threat to Nathan about going back to California, not for a million bucks. So I felt fortified for another encounter with the river man as the three of us went off to the gig. I felt as if somehow I'd be able to fight Egan, that now I knew what was what, and was ready for him, ready to stand in between him and Nathan. The trouble was, I realized, as our first set got going, that there was no practical way to do that. Egan had been his usual affable, glowing self as he greeted us. I was careful to be nice, having some dim idea about psyching him out and then catching him off guard. Nathan seemed strong and happy to be there, and we got off to a great start. Of course, Egan watched Nate, and I made a few attempts to work the stage and stand in his line of vision, but then he would just casually move, so that was futile. I should have realized then that everything I did would be futile against something like Egan, but oh, we are so all-powerful at twenty. I kept trying to think of ways I could distract him. Start a fight? Start a fire? Find the circuit breakers and shut off all the lights? But no really fine plan came to mind, and Nathan was at his best, glowing translucent, it seems to me now, playing the hell out of Egan's ovation and the old piano, murmuring and laughing in Paige's ear between songs. "'Kiss her, Nate!' one of the regulars yelled from the pool table. Nathan blushed and ducked his head at the crowd's laughter, but he laughed back, more pleased than embarrassed. "'That's a good idea, actually,' Egan told him on break. "'A crowd loves a romance, especially after they've gotten to know you.' "'You love it, too, you pervert,' I thought. "'Something else for you to feed off of. "'Besides, it'll make a nice angle when the Nashville papers come to write you guys up, "'which I hope will be any weekend now.' "'Egan's smile and glance turned to me. "'Of course,' he said. "'That'll leave you as the odd man out, Tim.' "'Used to it,' I said. "'Egan's grin broadened. "'Never had a lady like Paige?' Since Paige was sitting right there, I couldn't say what I really wanted to say, which was that it was none of his damn business. Ladies like Paige are hard to find, I said. Nathan smiled and nuzzled Paige's hair, and she kissed him. Too late, I realized Egan was watching me closely for my reaction, and I knew my face had given me away. Well, fuck you anyway, I thought, feeling like, once again, he'd set me up and gotten just what he wanted. From a musical standpoint, the peak of that evening was the Led Zeppelin cover Nathan and I had worked up, the old tune Gallows Pole. Nowadays you'd call it an unplugged version since it was just Nate on acoustic and me singing. Paige graciously sat this one out. I didn't scream it like Robert Plant. I sang it more like I thought the original ballad sounded. But Nathan borrowed heavily from Jimmy Page and the tune had the eerie foreboding of the Zepp version. The crowd ate it up, with Nathan and me playing off each other, and not until the song ended with a final flourish from Nate did I remember Egan. When I looked, I saw him behind the bar, both hands braced flat, watching Nathan from under his brows with the most extreme version of that look I'd seen yet. My stomach turned. But what the hell were we supposed to do? I wondered in frustration. Shut down? be mediocre and lackluster to avoid giving Egan anything? Might as well quit as do that. Might as well be dead. At the second break, I could see Nathan getting that bruised look around his eyes. Already, I knew the signs so well. You're not pacing yourself, I muttered as I passed him to leave the stage. You're not either, he snapped back. 
but Paige picked right up on it and sided with me. He doesn't get as tired as you do, honey, she told Nate. He's not as intense. Yeah, I'm not the sensitive type, I agreed. I'm your basic rock and roll clod. Play all night, sleep and scratch all day. They both laughed, and Nathan looked less tired. Maybe that was another antidote, healthy laughter. This idea led into another as I watched Nathan lay Egan's ovation carefully into its case. Nathan playing Egan's guitar was very probably not a good idea. Who knew what kind of spell or bad mojo was connected with that instrument? And where the hell was Nate's own guitar anyway? The deal had been, I remembered, that Egan was going to send it to Kirbyville to have some neck work done. That had been weeks ago, yet several times since then I had seen the guild still in its case, set aside up in the studio. I hadn't noticed last night if it was still there. Maybe Egan had never intended to have the neck straightened. Maybe he was holding on to the guitar for some weird reason of his own. All of a sudden, it seemed imperative for me to find out. Egan was behind the bar, laughing and talking. You guys get us some beers, I said to Nathan. I'll be right back. I went into the back hall and peered up the staircase. A faint light showed at the top. With a last look over my shoulder to make sure Egan wasn't coming, I started up the steps as quietly as I could. One row of track lights turned on at the far end of the studio gave enough light for me to look around. I had no idea what I would do if I found the damn guitar, take it and run. I hadn't thought about anything like that. All I wanted was to see where it was. But it wasn't where I remembered, against the wall behind the soundboard. I went farther and farther back into the long, shadowy room, scouting. At the end of one of the side walls was a door which in my memory had always been closed. Now it was ajar. After looking over my shoulder once again, I pushed it open and stuck my head in. It was Egan's bedroom. We had always wondered where he slept. The only light, a faint greenish one, came from an elaborately decorated aquarium on the far side of the room. Something about it looked strange until I realized there were no fish in it, at least none moving or visible. The only other thing was a heavy, carved wooden bed, high and old-fashioned, and covered with a plain white spread. Lying on top of it, in plain view, out of its case, was the guild. It lay as if someone had been sitting on the bed playing it, then pushed it casually aside. I stared at it, trying to swallow the nasty shock I'd gotten on seeing it there. Then I got an even worse shock when I heard Egan's icy, faintly amused voice behind me. Can I help you find something? Brazen it out, I told myself. No lie will get you out of this one. Already found it, I said, turning. I was looking for Nate's guitar. Why? Egan stood in the exact center of the large room, his head tipped, hands in his pockets. He watched me with the same amused, pitying look he'd given me after I saw the spade in his kitchen. You said you were going to take it to have the neck straightened. What's it doing on your bed instead? You don't like me very much, do you, Tim? I don't like you at all, I said, and started past him. But when I got to the head of the stairs, the shadowiest part of the room, somehow there he was, standing in front of me. Like me or not, he said, but the fact remains, for Nathan's sake, you and I need to be on the same side. What do you mean by that? Egan stepped toward me. It was all I could do not to back away. I know what you want, he said. I saw it in your face tonight. What do I want? I never actually saw him step any closer, but suddenly he was so near me I could sense heat rising off him. I couldn't see him very well, no gleam from his hair or eyes. I could only feel his nearness and warmth, and worst of all, it wasn't unpleasant. "'You want this,' he said, in a soft, light voice that inexplicably was Paige's, and I will swear to this day that the lips that kissed me then in the near darkness were Paige's lips, and the small, soft hands unzipping my jeans and traveling downward inside them were Paige's. I dreamed of this so many times, and all I knew was that now it was really happening, and God help me, I kissed back and slid my hands around her warm, naked waist, moving helplessly against her hand grasping me, and sun and light exploded as I shut my eyes. But then her cool voice was calling me, 
and for some reason it was coming from downstairs. Oh, Timmy, she called playfully from the hall downstairs, and then I realized what I was doing and who I was doing it with, and it felt like a sickening electric shock. You shit! I wrenched away from him, from the hands and face that had turned rough and hard. In a frenzy to get away, I half stumbled, half fell down the stairs, trying to put my jeans back together and trying not to throw up, and Egan stood at the top of the stairs, cursing a low, vicious blue streak I could hear all the way down. Nathan and Paige were in the hall when I reached the bottom. There you are, Nathan said, then saw my face. What's the matter? I pushed past them to the men's room, where I kept throwing up, even after there was nothing left to throw up, dimly grateful nobody else was in there. Finally, I straightened up, shaking violently, and came out of the stall. Nathan leaned against the sink, waiting for me. You going to be okay? he asked. I ran water and scooped some into my mouth to rinse it out, and drank a little. My throat burned from all the bile. Yeah. Tim, what happened? Nothing happened. I'm fine. I just got sick, that's all. What were you doing upstairs in the studio? I just... I went up to ask Egan something. Egan's not up there. He's in the bar. I'm sure he is, I said wearily, and pushed the door open, Nathan following me bewilderedly. There was no way I could tell him about this. It was so crazy that he would start believing I was the weird one, making up stories and trying to screw things up. And Egan, of course, knew that as well as I did. He was indeed in the bar, serving people and talking. He paid no attention as we walked past. But once we were on stage and playing again, by now I was calm enough to function musically, he stood and glared at me so hard I could feel it, even when I wasn't looking. In a fragmented sort of way, between songs or when I was only playing rhythm, I tried to figure out why he'd done what he'd done. Surely he didn't want sex from me any more than he wanted it from Nathan, because by now I knew I'd been wrong about that. No, he'd been doing it to gain power over me, seducing me first, then counting on my homophobic shame to keep me from saying or doing anything against him for fear of exposure. The fact that I'd broken away from him, with the unwitting help of Paige, hadn't been part of the plan. Egan stayed in a fury at me for the rest of the night, and I began to feel a deep, grim satisfaction. So you're not so all-powerful after all, I thought, glancing at his tight, angry face. You can be thwarted. You can be pulled away from. At least now he wasn't focusing on Nathan. Maybe that was the answer. If I kept getting him mad at me, it'd distract him from Nate. At the end of the night, Nathan was tired, but only normally, not in that totally sapped way. This time, I was the one who was exhausted. Egan handed our pay to me with a sneer and a small, courtly bow. Outside, Nathan and Paige kissed by her car, while I waited inside the station wagon, feeling martyred. Nathan hummed all the way home and fell healthily asleep while I lay watching the shadows on the ceiling, alternating between anger and a creeping sort of fear. He had to wake me for church the next morning. At first I considered a plea of sickness. All I wanted to do was hide. Then I decided church was the best place for me, with Egan after me now. Come on, Nathan said. You've got just enough time to shower and grab a cup of coffee. Service starts in twenty minutes. He was already dressed and ready to go, serene and clear-eyed and rested. I knew that this was because, for once, I'd been the one taking shit from Egan. This didn't make me mad at Nathan, of course, but it made me absolutely furious at Egan in a weary, burning sort of way. It seemed to prove everything. There was no way I could go back and not believe it now. Church didn't calm me the way it usually did. It seemed stuffy, and the tinny organ jangled at my nerves, and some old lady sat near me wearing a sweet, powdery scent that made me want to throw up all over again. I couldn't sing along with the hymns or make the responses. My throat was sore, my tongue heavy, my head aching. Nathan sang in perfect tune and seemed happy. His mind wasn't on church, though. 
he took one of the stubby little pencils from the holder in the back of the pew, provided so that newcomers could fill out visitors' cards, and started jotting notes for a new song on his bulletin. "'More power to you, Nate,' I thought tiredly. "'Egan will chew that up and spit it out, too, and it'll all just come to nothing.' At first I didn't even listen to Brother Whitley's sermon. I usually didn't, not closely. I faded in and out, probably the way most people do during a church sermon. What got my attention, finally, was Nathan. He had grown tense and still, staring into his lap, the pencil idle in his hand. His face wore its obstinate look. Bewildered, I started listening. "'If it feels good, do it,' Brother Whitley was saying. "'That's all you hear today. Whatever turns you on, man.' I heard Artis behind me give a long, theatrical sigh. And I want to say to these young people, these confused young people of the counterculture, you are going off on the wrong track. Is he aiming this at us? I wondered. It's not what feels good to you, what turns you on, that is important. It's what the Lord has called you to do that is important. But why did those necessarily have to be two different things? Put yourself in second place, Brother Whitley warned. Follow the example of John the Baptist. He did not claim to be the Christ just to gain himself a large following. He said, I am not fit to tie the shoes of the one who is to come. Nathan, I told him silently, this has nothing to do with you and your music. But, of course, what his father was saying contrasted totally with what I'd advised earlier in the summer about taking a chance and doing what he wanted and worrying later about what God thought. In fact, that was the next road Brother Whitley went down. Now I warn you, he said conversationally, that God will not be mocked. You don't do as you please, then ask forgiveness. This is not Christian freedom. This is not Christian liberty. No, you pray without ceasing. I remembered that Nathan had said he couldn't pray. You never take your eyes from that heavenly vision which renders you a lowly servant at the foot of the cross. There was more in the same vein, but I tuned out. I had no idea if this was just one of Brother Whitley's standard sermons or if he was aiming this at Nathan, maybe to get back at him for skipping church Friday night and going with Egan. The more I thought about it, the more I didn't think that was Brother Whitley's style. He was more direct. Even so, Nathan was certainly taking it to heart. He sat in a distant sulk for the rest of the sermon. Well, not a sulk. Sulks don't imply despair. And there was despair in the drawn lines of his face, the slump of his shoulders, as we went up for communion. This was the second time I'd had communion in that church, and I remembered my clumsy prayer the first time and how it had felt. Desperate, I prayed again, this time for Nate. Don't let it shake him up so bad. This is killing him. He takes stuff like this too hard. I waited, but nothing happened. I thought guiltily of all the other prayers I should have been making about him and Egan, probably, and the enormity of that caved in on me, and I lost the small thread of faith. I accepted the tiny bread pillow and the grape juice and went back to my seat feeling heavy and lost. Nathan didn't sit back down in the pew beside me. Before I knew it, he was heading on down the side aisle, out the front doors. Artis leaned forward and hissed, "'Where's he going? What's the matter?' I shrugged. Mrs. Whitley frowned worriedly down from the choir loft. Brother Whitley was still passing grape juice and didn't notice. I considered going after Nate, but I knew him well enough now to understand he wanted to be by himself. During the invitation hymn, a new family came forward to join the church, which involved a lot of responses, and then, of course, the whole congregation was supposed to file by and greet them. I'd have sneaked away before that, but Artis grabbed me and made me go with her, asking me again if Nathan was okay and what happened. It was apparently a big deal to walk out of church without being dismissed. I greeted the new family, feeling like a Class A hypocrite, and then Mrs. Whitley, having taken off her choir robe and come out into the fast-emptying sanctuary, corralled me and asked about Nathan. I guess the heat just got to him and he went out for some air. 
Well, is he still outside? Mrs. Whitley peered down the aisle out to the steps. Hadn't we better go see about him? I was pretty sure Nathan wasn't still hanging around outside. I'll go look for him in a minute. Brother Whitley came down the aisle, having shaken hands with the last departing church member. The Thompsons invited us out to dinner with them, he said, meaning Sunday dinner right now. They're waiting for us out front. Where's Nathan? Mrs. Whitley just looked at me anxiously. You know, Nathan wasn't feeling well, I said. He may have gone on back to the house. Sick to his stomach? Brother Whitley asked concernedly. Yeah, that would do. He sure looked like it. Why don't the three of you go ahead, and I'll stay here and keep an eye on him. I watched Brother Whitley carefully. He looked worried about Nathan and disappointed, I guess, that he couldn't show off his son to the Thompsons. But he seemed innocent of any suspicion that his sermon had upset Nate, and I absolved him right then of doing it on purpose. He'd only been preaching his regular sermon for the week. All right, he said. Can you find yourself some lunch, son? Chicken noodle soup, Mrs. Whitley told me. That'll be good for Nathan and some bread and butter. Brother Whitley was already hurrying her down the aisle. Artis followed, after giving me a thoroughly disgusted and envious look that said she would have been glad to have an upset stomach to get out of going. I winked at her, turned off all the sanctuary lights, and went out the back way. Nathan had the key, so we'd have to lock up later. I didn't bother going to the parsonage to look for him. I knew where he was, and started out through the back field toward the river, determinedly not thinking about snakes and glad when I got to the shade of the trees. I picked my way through the brush and came out on the river bank, and there was Nathan, under the big sycamore, sitting with his legs drawn up and his head over on his knees. When I went over and sat down by him, he didn't even lift his head. After a minute, I said, Your folks and artists went out to eat. No answer. Look, Nate, I'd bet money your dad wasn't aiming that sermon at you. He was just preaching his regular thing. He sighed then, still keeping his head down. Tim, he said, don't make me talk. All right. I waited, listening to the birds and cicadas and the faint wash of the river below us. It felt hot and damp after yesterday's rain, and I took off my tie and unbuttoned a couple of my shirt buttons. At last Nathan raised his head, relaxed his arms, and leaned back against the tree. He didn't look at me, but stared out across the river to the far bank. You know what, he said finally, I never have imagined God as an old guy with a long beard like most people do. Okay, I thought. When I was a kid, that story in Genesis about God throwing Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden really impressed me, it scared me. I imagined him filling up the whole sky in this big purple swirling cloak and black hair and eyebrows and a stern, stern face. I knew he was talking basically to himself, so I kept quiet. And that's still what I see, Nathan said, and that's how it feels. Screw up and you're out of here. He put his head back over on his knees. Nathan, I asked him, do you really, honestly believe your music could be wrong? This time when he raised his head, he looked straight at me. It will be, he said, if it doesn't do any good in the world. And that scares me to death. Yeah, that's sure conducive to creativity. And here you've been telling me to pace myself, and there isn't time for that. I have to prove it's all worth something. I have to make something good out of it. Okay, okay. His voice was breaking, and I just wanted to calm him down. You will. You are. I can't fail, he said, or I won't be allowed to keep doing it. I sat dully, wondering at the hopelessness of the situation. Here I was, trying to fight the devil or whatever Egan was, while Nathan was caught in the unflinching gaze of an angry God. Nathan, I told him, you've just got to do your best, man, and you are. That's all anybody can do. No comfort there. He just stared past me, thinking I was only handing him platitudes, I suppose. I noticed his eyes were swollen, the way they always were when he smoked pot, and I wondered if he'd had a joint in his pocket all through church— 
or if he'd had the presence of mind to stop by the car for his stash on his way to the river. Neither seemed likely. Finally, I said, Listen, you better come back to the house and eat something. Oh, eat, he said wearily, but he got slowly to his feet. He had that wintry look in his eyes, what I could see of them, the way he looked at his father Friday night, just before we left with Egan and Geoffrey. Somehow, I felt, he wasn't all there any more. After his burst of talking, he'd withdrawn out of pure exhaustion. I followed him back through the trees and brush, and we started up through the field. I was still wondering about his eyes and where he'd gotten the pot, and it wasn't until we reached the back yard that it dawned on me he'd been crying. <laughs>